conic section means a line of intersection where a plane slices a cone. Cone means essentially just a very thin ice cream cone. Not one of those cup-style wafer cones. You have to order the pointy sugar cone. And note that the ancient Greeks, who named these things in the first place, always ate their ice cream out of a double cone consisting of two sugar cones welded tip to tip. Eurythmists know it as the gesture for the sun. If the plane slices both parts of the cone, you get a hyperbola. If it slices the cone through one side only, you get an ellipse. If the intersecting plane lies parallel to the side of the cone, that is, parallel to exactly one ray of the cone, then the line of intersection keeps widening in one direction, and you get a parabola. As the plane moves, the three curves pass over into one another. Projectively, they are all the same, being all of them perspective from the vertex of the cone. All conics are perspective images of circles. These here are all concentric circles. With the hyperbola, you look beyond the horizon, upward, through the infinite distance, to see the underside of the part of the circle that lies behind you. To realize that all types of conics are versions of one and the same entity, it helps to picture them in movement. Here we have two tangents with symmetrically facing tangent points, plus one other given point. That makes five, since tangent points are double points. In other words, they determine exactly one conic curve. Pause if you want to picture it. Here it is. Next, move the tangent on the right farther off, like this. What does that do to the curve? Pause if you want to picture it on your own. The shape is stretched horizontally. It has also expanded a little vertically. No need to waste time. What happens when the tangent is infinitely distant? A parabola is an ellipse tangent to the infinitely distant line of the plane. And why stop there? Keep moving the tangent to the right through the infinite distance and it returns from the left. A hyperbola is an ellipse that has been turned inside out by crossing the infinitely distant line. As the tangent continues to approach, the conic starts to hint at another of its guises, which then appears when the two tangents coincide. Can you see it? Thus, an X is a section through the vertex of a cone. Cross and circle are projectively identical. What next? The right-hand tangent 
is now pushing the curve rather than pulling it. What happens when the tangent passes over the other fixed point? More tricks. One more picture. Now the tangent is back to pulling the curve behind it again. Cast the shadow of a circle at a slant, and you get an ellipse. This particular light source is a candle, as you can clearly see. As the candle burns down, the shadow lengthens and broadens. When the flame is level with the top of the circle, it casts the tangent, that is, the top of the square framing the circle, to the infinitely distant line of the plane, making the shadow of the circle a parabola. Then, when the flame is level with the interior of the circle, the upper part of the shadow passes through the infinite distance to the upper right, returns from the lower left, and falls upward onto the bottom of the table. What they showed you in school was always only a fragment of a parabola. What they never showed you was the whole thing, now did they? To see the whole parabola, you only have to tilt the blackboard. And lo and behold, the ever-widening curve turns out to be a closed loop. This is simply y equals x squared. Count the squares and you'll see. Here is the same parabola from a sharper angle. Yes, thanks to the Florentine Renaissance, we now know how to make infinitely distant events visible. So let's do the same for the hyperbola. The so-called asymptote, the word actually means it never touches, does touch the curve after all, namely in the infinite distance. And no, it is not a flex tangent as you can see here. Ellipses curl toward pointness. Hyperbolas stretch toward lineness. The parabola holds the balance. This threefoldness corresponds to the human body, as Ernst Bindel noted. The forces that form our body, when lifted into consciousness, become geometry. The discovery of the threefold human body by Rudolf Steiner, with far reaching consequences, identifies the seat of thinking in the neural and sensory processes, pervading the whole body, but especially concentrated in the head, the seat of feeling in the rhythmic processes, pervading the whole body, especially manifest in the chest, and the seat of willing 
in the metabolic and kinetic processes pervading the whole body, especially active in the abdomen and the limbs. Likewise, the poles of repose and action appear in ellipse and hyperbola. The ellipse can be surveyed as a finished picture, whereas thinking the hyperbola requires dynamic inner activity. It exits the field of view in four directions. Any direction you follow leads you out through the infinite distance and back again from the opposite direction, then curves off in another direction, and so on. This picture is by Binda. And yes, there are also projective definitions of the center of a conic, major and minor axes, focus, directrix, and all those things. All in due time. We conclude today's lesson with a quiz. What do you call this? As you can see, it's a cylinder with a circular cross-section, like a pipe or a stem. What is the technical term in projective morphology? Spoiler alert! A cone! You heard right. The vertex is infinitely distant, and all its hyperbolas are parallels. Class dismissed.